the University of Massachusetts Amherst. For an institution once carelessly disregarded as a party school, UMass boasts some pretty impressive alumni. Among those are one Nobel Prize winner, one National Humanities Medal recipient, one astronaut, three Pulitzer Prize winners, two Academy Award winners, members of three legendary rock groups, multiple CEOs, dozens of professional athletes, countless activists, journalists, and public servants, and of course, Jeffrey Donovan, star of USA's Burn Notice. But the UMass alumni who has inspired me the most isn't any of these people. It's this guy, Kevin Harrington. I've known Kevin since my freshman year when I began attending a meditation group that he led. Over the years we became friends and I can genuinely say that he is one of the most compassionate people I've ever met. But beyond just being an overall great guy, Kevin accomplished more in his undergraduate career than most. He started a meditation group, which grew from a few close friends to 30 plus people multiple times a week. He went from teaching himself to play West African drums by banging on them in the woods to playing amongst the likes of legends like Charles Neville and Tony Vaca. After sharpening his skills during a semester abroad in Senegal, Kevin brought what he learned back to Amherst and founded UMass's first African drum circle class, which I took three times. He was a member of local Amherst group Softcore Porn and Shoka Zoba. He hosted a world music show on WMUA 91.1 FM called Global Vibes. He was a co-founder of the UMass Belly Dance Club. He even met Werner Herzog, and I know what you might be thinking. That's all great. But what really sets Kevin apart from other UMass alum? I'm glad you asked. Last year, Kevin led a team of researchers who discovered eight new galaxies, each over 10 billion years old, which have been described as the most fantastically luminous ever observed in human history. These things appear to have a luminosity that is 100 trillion times the luminosity of our sun. A hundred. So it's amazing. Yeah. A hundred trillion times our sun. I mean, that's Kevin talking to NPR's Heather Goldstone on her show Living Lab back in June. If these galaxies are so bright, why were they not seen before? I believe it's a combination of my advisor's insight to look for these things and to look for these things with the latest technology that was publicly released only a couple of years ago. So it's very new data. The Planck telescope and Herschel telescopes that went out into space, uh, they each had their respective missions to go out and look for a range of astronomical objects, including the earliest forming galaxies in the universe. Kevin goes on to fill in the details, how last year he traveled to Mexico working under the supervision of UMass astronomy professor Min Yun as part of a research group studying star formations with a large millimeter telescope. Kevin credits Professor Yun as a mentor, and later in the interview speaks of his reverence for the value of education. Teachers are human beings that, you know, are not often seen as that. There, there's, there's some sort of wall between teachers and students sometimes and you know i really took advantage of all the office hours and really connecting with teachers on a deeper level so that i can establish a bond there and really try to learn to understand this bond and put kevin's breakthrough into greater context i went to speak with professor young himself the most important thing about uh, this discovery is that this was not predicted by theory um i'm working in the field where we're, we're ahead, you know, observation of the data is ahead of theory. So the theorists are now revising models of how galaxies come about, how the universe, after the Big Bang, started forming galaxies and large structures like galaxies and groups of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So we basically provide uh, constraints on, on the model and whether these a few exceptional objects um, require wholesale changes or small modifications depends on the details of you know how the theory is working out but nevertheless that's really my job and job of my students like Kevin who push the data and and force the theorists to think a little bit deeper this is pretty unusual among the undergraduate students who work with me and I had a, quite a few over the last 15 years at UMass Kevin is probably the most successful in terms of discovering something and producing a paper. It's a combination of you know having the right projects and being at the right place at the right time, but also Kevin is pretty exceptional in that he has an unusual drive, very focused, and he, he persisted. 
And so it's a really combination of all of these things that come together. Um, I'm looking forward to having more students like that, but there aren't too many Kevins around. <laughs> Professor Yun was right. Kevin's story was definitely one of a kind, with his humble demeanor contrasting with the sheer magnitude of his discovery. I wanted to discuss this with someone who knew him well. Cameron Moros is Kevin's former sweet mate. He took over guiding the meditation group after Kevin graduated. And not tensing yet, but for the tensing portion, just be creating a, a fist, kind of a tight fist. And we'll squeeze for about four seconds, which I'll count out loud. Slowly One thing that I learned from Kevin that I try to incorporate a lot into my meditations is setting intentions. And he would often leave a space, usually near the end, uh, where it, people that were listening could set an intention that they wanted to accomplish, usually in the near future, like that night per se. And I, I thought that was very powerful because I found that I was much more likely to follow through on intention that I actively set. And sometimes he would incorporate, you know, visualizing, actualizing that intention and not necessarily having that be something big or grandiose, but something maybe even really small. Like I want to read before bed. I want to, you know, smile at the next friend that I see or share some words of encouragement. I think intention is very powerful and Kevin has been very influential in me coming to that perspective. And I try to actively incorporate that into the way that I guide. What did you think when you had heard that, that he had discovered these galaxies that have been like undiscoverable for years that of all people, he just kind of figured that out? I was at a loss for words, completely blown away. But at the same time, if any, almost anyone else told me that, I would have like laughed or been like, oh, that's like, haha, very funny. Like that's not even possible. Right. But since it was Kevin that shared that, I, I believed him, like right away. There was no like skepticism about it whatsoever um, because he's Kevin and because he's so motivated and driven and, di and so disciplined and passionate about what he does that I knew that he did that once he shared it. And I, I still haven't fully been able to absorb the, the incredible effect that his discoveries have had and how huge of a discovery it is it continues to befuddle me and, you know, put me in this position of all I can say is, whoa. As the day began to ease down, the only person I'd yet to talk to was the man himself. Kevin is currently working on his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn, Germany. I was eager to hear how he was doing and his personal reflections on the discovery one year later. It's really a blessing to be able to study this this subject. Uh, in a sense, uh, I get to see the light from my galactic ancestors. What was your first reaction when you realized, like, what you had discovered? I think it was probably disbelief. I mean, not in the sense that I didn't want to believe uh, that we got a detection that we had written a proposal to get the observing time and then finally went to the telescope and pointed to the sky and, and got what we were looking for. I mean, looking back at it now, it's very, uh, it, it's mind boggling. Yeah. And what, just in general, what human beings are doing and reaching the farthest depths of science. I asked him how he dealt with the sudden flurry of public attention he got when the story broke. It, it was def definitely difficult to go from one interview to the next, and especially at the very beginning, um, I had the flu and and just wasn't feeling right. Mm. And it was at the same time that all these interviews and things were coming along. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I didn't forget where I came from. And, and I noticed in myself a uh, development of this internal strength to really, really appreciate all the support that I've had and continue to have. Finally, I thought that since I've looked to this guy in the past for some form of meditative guidance, I might as well ask him for any advice he could pass on to someone about to graduate and enter the real world. You just have to do your best in applying those skills that you've learned about yourself. Then you can have as much fun and experiment and 
in life experiences and know that you have this reserve at all times of skills that you have developed and such as learning how you learn and you can continually apply this and so taking that and being creative with it really generating dreams and achieving little tasks on a day-to-day basis that promote self-growth.